two Canadian provinces and the District of Columbia. Now, what makes him interesting and deserving, I, that's perhaps the, not the, the, the right term to use in this context, but why I, I thought he should be in the book, is the fact that he stole these books not out of greed, not to sell them, as most other book thieves have done, but because he loved them and to collect them. Syndicated columnist Nicholas Baspains and his book, A Gentle Madness, Bibliophiles, Bibliomanes, and the Eternal Passion for Books. Sunday night on Book Notes at 8 Eastern and Pacific Time. Today on C-SPAN 2, African American Men and Society, a forum hosted by Howard University. Panelists discuss the status of African American men in today's society and examine a recent report by the Federal Sentencing Commission. The program airs today at 11 a.m. Eastern Time, 8 a.m. Pacific on C-SPAN 2. Next, President Clinton in a Friday night speech to the Williamsburg, Virginia Business Council. He talks about the budget, trade, and the economy. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States, accompanied by the officers of the Business Council and their wives. As the preacher says, please have a seat. I'd like to introduce our guests this evening, and then I'll introduce the president who will speak before dinner. Minister Cavallio and his wife Sonia from Argentina. <laughs> Minister Milan and his wife Katerina, Brazil. Minister Ortiz and his wife, Margie, Mexico. <laughs> Mr. Ruggiero, Director General, World Trade Organization, who's been working the crowd all day today. <laughs> Ms. Laura Tyson, Assistant to the President on e for Economic Policy. And the Honorable Richard M. Daly, Mayor of the City of Chicago, and his wife Maggie, who made a great presentation to us today. <laughs> Mr. President, it's a great honor for all of us to have you be with us this evening. You were properly introduced today by your friend, Hugh Seide. I want you to know, compared to his characterization of your chief rivals, you came out remarkably well. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. The last time I was with the Woolards, uh, we were in Jackson Hole, Wyoming, in the Grand Tetons, and uh, this outfit would have been highly inappropriate there. I felt more at home, but I s saw Ed tonight, and I kind of, I'm jealous of that beautiful shirt. I want to know where you got it. <laughs> I'm so glad to see all of you. I know some of our administration members have been here. Uh, Secretary Rubin, who feels right at home. I still can't believe Bob Rubin's a Democrat. <laughs> 
He told me not very long ago we were going to have to change the currency to avoid counterfeiting. And I said, well, all right. And he said, but I want to start with $100 bills. <laughs> so that's where we started. I have reviewed uh, a little bit about who spoke here today and what they said. And uh, Ed, if Hugh Sidey really said that, he must have been awful tough on the people who were running against me. <laughs> I want to talk to you tonight about, obviously, about the major controversy presently raging in Washington about uh, the balanced budget. But I want to try to set the stage for what this is really means and what's really going on. And I'd like to begin with what I think is the most important thing, which is what kind of country we live in and what kind of country we wish to live in and what kind of country we wish to live our, leave for our children and our grandchildren. That, after all, is the most important thing of all. When I sought this job in 1992, I did it because I wanted to restore the American dream for all of our people and because I wanted this country to go into the next century still as the world's leader for freedom and peace and prosperity and democracy. Because I really believe that we're all better off in a country where people have opportunity but exercise responsibility, where we strengthen work but we also strengthen our families and where we recognize that the real power in America should be at the community level where people work together and where they deal with each other directly instead of through the filters that exist between me in Washington and you where you live. This is a remarkable period of success for America's economy. All of you are doing a remarkable job. We've had a great two and a half years, and I believe there are better times ahead if we make the right decisions. Uh, it's a time of profound change. We're moving from the industrial to the information and technology age. We've moved out of the Cold War into a global marketplace. We have problems, to be sure, but they're nowhere near as great as the opportunities we have. When I sought the presidency, I said that I wanted to do three things. I wanted to restore pro-growth economics. I wanted to put mainstream values back at the heart of our social policy. And I wanted to give America a modern government that was more entrepreneurial and smaller and gave more authority to the state and local governments, to the private sector, and operated more as a partner with others to build a better America. I said then, and I believe I have been true to this, that I wanted to see new ideas injected into our political life, everything from welfare reform to national service to empowerment zones for our inner cities to the reinventing government program that the vice president has done such a good job with. I said I would make a good faith effort to move beyond the partisan labels that had divided people so much in the past. And believe it or not, I have done my best to do that. It's a lot harder in Washington than it is in the state capitals and the cities of the country, but it can be done and it will be done again, I believe, in the next few weeks. I also believe then, and I believe more strongly now, that in a time of change, it's important that the president make decisions based on their long-term impact as opposed to their short-term benefits or burdens. Now, if you look at the last two and a half years, you must all be very proud. Our country has produced seven and a half million jobs, two and a half million new homeowners, about two million new small business owners, the largest number of new small businesses in such a time period in the history of the United States, a record number of new self-made millionaires. Trade has increased in the last three years from 4% in 93, 10% in 94, and it's going up 16% this year, our exports. The deficit has come from 290 a year down to $160 billion a year. Of course, there are still problems. In any period of profound change, there tends to be a big disruption and a significant problem of income inequality. We have that in America. We need to get more energy and growth back into middle class families' incomes. We have still some isolated areas in our country that have not felt the benefits of this recovery. And I believe that the budget proposal now in Congress would undermine our economic growth in the future.
unless it's modified significantly, and I'll say more about that in a moment. I think the policies of this administration have made a contribution to that economic record by reducing the deficit, by expanding trade through NAFTA and GATT and taking all those outdated Cold War controls off of our high technology exports, by concluding over 80 trade agreements through the efforts of Ambassador Cantor, including 15 with Japan alone, by investing in technology, research and development, and defense conversion, and by working with so many of you to manifest a real commitment to the education of all Americans. More money, but also higher standards, higher expectation, and more accountability in education. If you look at the question of our social problems and whether we've been successful in putting middle-class values into our approach, you can all be somewhat hopeful there. The crime rate is down in almost every place in America. The murder rate is down. The welfare rolls are down. The food stamp rolls are down. The poverty rate is down. The teen pregnancy rate has gone down for two years in a row. Americans are reasserting their belief in old-fashioned personal, family, and community responsibility. And it is beginning to work. Yes, we have some problems. We still need to pass a national welfare reform plan, I believe. We still need to avoid the, the tendency that's now alive in Congress to believe that all you need to do on the crime problem is to put people in jail and we don't need anything to do with prevention and giving our young people something to say yes to. But basically, we are moving in the right direction to reassert and reinsert into American life mainstream values. And I believe the initiatives of our administration have played a role in that. The crime bill, which is putting 100,000 more police on the street, keeping repeat offenders off the street, passing the Brady Bill, passing the assault weapons ban, doing things that enable our local communities to help prevent crimes. I think it's making a difference. I believe the work we've done in what the New York Times called a quiet revolution in welfare. Our administration has given 35 states over 40 separate approvals to get around federal rules and regulations to move people from welfare to work. When the Congress wouldn't pass the bill, we just decided to reform welfare state by state, community by community. We have offered all 50 states within a, any 30-day period a complete relief from any number of federal rules and regulations if they will present a comprehensive plan to move people from welfare to work without hurting their children. I think when we almost doubled the family tax credit that President Reagan said was the best anti-poverty program the country had ever come up with, so that we can now say that anybody who works 40 hours a week and has children in the home will not live in poverty. That was a major step toward rewarding work and family and helping us to reward, uh, reform welfare and get people out of welfare into the work roles. I think the National Service Program is an important advance. We celebrated its first year yesterday with a young woman from Kansas City who's working her way through college from an inner city neighborhood in Kansas City with a project of young volunteers who have closed 44 crack houses in Kansas City in the last year. And this is the kind of thing being done by these young people all over America, whether they're building houses with Habitat for Humanity, tutoring kids in rural Kentucky where they have increased the grade level in reading by threefold in one year, are helping to fight the crime problem. All these things manifest our values. And something I know that means a lot to all of you, we have tried to give the American people a more modern government. The size of the federal government tonight, when I left Washington, was 163,000 smaller than it was the day I became president. It's the smallest federal government since John Kennedy was president. We will reduce it by another 110,000 in the next two years, no matter what the Congress does with this budget. This government, as a percentage of the civilian non-farm payroll, is the smallest government the United States has had in Washington since 1933. Now, those are facts. We've reduced 16,000 pages of regulations, cut the regulations of the Small Business Administration by 50 percent, the regulations of the Education Department by 40 percent. Next year, the paperwork time that businesses spend fooling with the Environmental Protection Agency will be down by 25 percent. 
More important than all that to me, I think our government's working better. The Small Business Administration's cut its budget by 40 percent and doubled its loan output. The Export-Import Bank is helping small businesses that never knew what it was before to sell their products all around the world. The Commerce Department and the State Department have done more good for American businesses overseas than any Commerce Department and State Department in modern history, and every one of you who has worked with them know that that is the absolute truth. We are moving forward to give you a government that works. Some, the automobile industry has been working with us in partnership to produce a clean car. It is a big deal. 1995 was the hottest year for the planet Earth since the present temperature system was devised. China is growing rapidly. If everybody in China winds up with a car and you don't want the atmosphere of this Earth to burn up, we had better find an efficient way of moving people around. And this is the sort of thing that we're trying to do. Now, let me tell you this, this will probably surprise you more than anything. Every year, Business Week, hardly an arm of the Democratic Party or my administration, recognizes outstanding businesses for performance in various categories. This year, in the category of service to consumers by telephone, the winner was not L.L. Bean or Federal Express, but the Social Security Administration of your federal government. So I think that we have made a contribution to modernizing the federal government. It's smaller. It's less bureaucratic. It is more entrepreneurial. It still has dumb things in the rules, and it does dumb things that drive me crazy that I find out about after it's over. But it is better than it was before by a very, very long shot. And the most important thing is we're trying to help move decisions back where people make them. The mayor of Chicago is here. Chicago received one of our empowerment zones, a new idea, helping to attract private investment into inner cities to grow the economy and give people a stake in America's future. Chicago received more funds for police, not because we know how to prevent crime, but they do if they have the means to do it, and funds for prevention to support programs like the ones in Chicago that have lowered the crime rate even though they make fodder for congressional speeches like midnight basketball better a kid on a basketball court than on a corner selling drugs or mugging somebody and winding up in jail. We didn't make the decisions. They make the decisions at the local level. We finally passed a bill to stop mandating costs on state and local governments that we don't help them pay for. These are the kinds of things that are going on. We are moving in the right direction. Your country is, and you ought to be proud of it. And America has been gratified to be a part of making peace in the Middle East, progress in Northern Ireland, the ceasefire in Bosnia, making sure that for the first time since the dawn of the nuclear age, there aren't any missiles pointed at Americans or their children tonight. North Korea is moving away from its nuclear program, and by the grace of God, we might get a comprehensive test ban treaty on all nuclear testing next year. We seem to be headed in that direction. Now, what does the future hold? First, we do have to balance the budget. It's the right thing to do to take the burden of debt off our children and free up capital for private sector investment. I'm really proud of the fact that way over 90 percent of the new jobs created in this recovery were created not by government, but in the private sector. That is exactly what we wanted to happen. So as we reduce the size of government, the private sector is growing more. We have to do it, but we have to do it consistent with our values and with our interests. The second thing we have to do is to expand trade. We have our friends here from the Americas. Uh, Mac McClarty, who's here with me, worked so hard last December on the Summit of the Americas, and we have worked to follow up on that. We believe that our partners in this hemisphere are a very, very important part of our future. We believe we have to build on NAFTA until we have partnerships with all these democratic governments to reward their moves to democracy, to freedom, to market economics with a genuine and respectful partnership with the United States. In that connection, I would say I was very well pleased with the remarkable uh, visit I just had with the President of Mexico and the fact that they have already paid back $700 million of the loan they received through our international financial package ahead of schedule being faithful to their commitments 
to modernize Mexico politically and economically. We have to continue to invest in technology and make it our friend, not our foe. People cannot afford to be afraid of the technological revolution that is sweeping the world. We just have to make sure that everybody can have access to it. And we have to give people the tools they need to succeed. In that connection, let me say I am very grateful for the support that we've gotten from the business community for every education initiative of our administration, from expanding Head Start to the Goals 2000 program, which focuses on national standards and grassroots reforms, to the expansion of student loans. And just a couple of days ago, I know the Secretary of Labor said this earlier, but I want to emphasize this because it achieved almost no public notice, largely because there were only two votes against this bill in the Senate. And when there's no controversy, it is often deemed not important. But with no controversy, a couple of days ago, the United States Senate adopted what I thought was one of the most important new ideas that I advocated in the State of the Union message, the GI Bill for America's Workers, consolidating 70 separate, marginally impacting federal training programs into a big fund and saying to unemployed people, we will just send you a voucher. We will send you a voucher if you lose your job and you can immediately take it to the nearest community college and begin to start your life again. Now that's very important. A lot of you pay a lot of unemployment tax. The unemployment system today is not relevant to the, to the times in which we live. When the unemployment system in America was developed, 85% of the people were called back to the jobs they were laid off from. Today, 85% of the people who are laid off are never called back to those jobs. If we want people to feel secure about the future, to have a stake in the future, we have to increase their sense of empowerment about it. That's what this GI Bill for America's workers will do. It's a very important idea, and we ought to stick with it and support it and properly fund it. Now, let me say something in all candor. To have, if we're going to continue to move forward in a time of change, you have to expect the leadership of the country to do what you have to do in a time of change. And that's to make decisions that are unpopular in the short run because they're right over the long run. Now, I have found as an elected official that everybody is for that in general, but they're against it in particular. And let me just give you some examples of the kind of things I've faced. I bet I've done five things that have made everybody in this room mad in the last two and a half years, at least five. But I want to give you a few. When I became president, I knew, based on my conversations with Mr. Greenspan, with people in the private markets, with others, that if we could reduce the deficit at least $500 billion in five years, we'd get a big drop in interest rates and a big boom in this economy. I knew that. And I knew, conversely, if we failed to do it, that we would continue to lengthen the sluggish economy which I confronted when I took office. So I made up my mind. Come hell or high water, we were going to reduce the deficit $500 billion. And the first week I showed up in Washington, the leaders of the minority in Congress, who are now the majority leader and the Speaker of the House, told me that I would not get one vote for my budget no matter what I did, not a single solitary vote. The policy was going to be just say no. As a consequence, I had to raise your taxes more and cut spending less than I wanted to which made a lot of you furious. All I know is we got a huge drop in the in interest rates and a big boom in the economy, and most everybody who paid more made more than they paid. And it was the right thing for the United States. It was wrong for them to refuse to cooperate with me, but they were richly rewarded for it later on. But our country is better off because we passed a deficit reduction plan, which over a seven-year period is about as big as the one we're debating in the Congress today. And that's what got this country going again. And we did it without cutting education or investment in technology or the environment or our future. I'll give you another example that affects the mayor here. When we d were debating the Brady Bill to require people to wait five days before they got a handgun and the assault weapons ban, all my political advisors said, don't do this. This is crazy. And I said, why do you think it's crazy? And they said, because everybody that's against this will vote against everybody who's for it. But all the people that are for it, they'll find some other reason to oppose you. 
That's why things don't get done in your country. Because organized interest and their intense opposition always overcome the generalized feeling of goodwill, which is not manifest in the same intensity of support. But you know what? Last year, 40,000 people with criminal records did not get handguns because of the Brady Law. And it was the right thing to do. And I am tired of picking up the newspaper and seeing kids that are honor students at school getting shot down, standing at bus stops by nuts with assault weapons. And by election time next time, every hunter in my state will know that nobody lost their hunting rifle. And it was all a big canard. There was nothing to it. But people are alive today because those decisions were made. The Teenage Smoking Initiative, same thing. Same folks came in and said, oh, don't do this. By the time the tobacco companies get through working on you, they'll convince every tobacco farmer in North Carolina and Tennessee that you're going to drive them in the poorhouse. They'll all vote against everybody with a D behind their name. They will bury you, and everybody in America that agrees with you will find some other reason not to support you. This is dumb politics. Well, it might be, but we studied that issue for 14 months. We found out two companies knew for 30 years what they were doing and kept on doing it and didn't own up to it. We found out that there were still deliberate attempts to advertise to young people. And most important, we found out that 3,000 kids a day start smoking and 1,000 of them are going to die sooner because of it. I don't know what you think 1,000 kids a day are worth, but to me, that's the kind of America I want to live in, where another 1,000 kids a day have longer, better, fuller lives because somebody doesn't sucker punch them into doing something they shouldn't do while they are still children. So it may be unpopular, but I think it was the right thing to do. The same thing, something where most of you agree with me, I think, the affirmative action issue. Everybody said, oh, you don't need to, you need to be against this. We need to stop this. But there is still racial discrimination in America, folks. When five federal law enforcement officials can't even get served in Denny's, there's a problem there. And I could give you a lot of other examples. I don't favor unfair preferences or quotas or reverse discrimination. Our administration has actually joined lawsuits against reverse discrimination in state. But everybody has to be considered in this country. The great meal ticket we've got to the future is that this is the most diverse, big, rich country in the world. Los Angeles County has 150 different racial and ethnic groups in one county. In the global village, it is a manna from heaven. But we have to learn to live together and work together with common values and a common chance to succeed. So we said, let's mend affirmative action, but let's don't end it. And I hope and believe it made it possible for the people who lead large companies in our country to follow the same policies. I could give you lots of other examples, but you get the idea. When you're going through a period of change like this, you can't even predict what's going to be popular. Last night, we celebrated one year of the restoration of democracy in Haiti. Well, when we threw the dictators out of Haiti, hardly anybody was for it, but it was the right thing to do. You can't let dictators come to the United States and stand in the shadow of the Statue of Liberty and promise they're going to leave and then go home and keep killing people in the street and never even blink an eye. The United States couldn't do that. When we helped our friends and neighbors in Mexico, most of you probably supported that. But the day I made the decision, there was a poll in the paper that said by 81 to 15, the American people were opposed to that. Half the people in the country who were for it were in the room at the time I decided to do it. <laughs> but it was the right thing to do because they're our neighbors, because they want to do the right thing, because they have the capacity to grow and become our strong partners and generate opportunities for you and incomes and jobs for America, because our real future here, no matter what happens to the movement toward free trade, is with our friends here in our backyard, in our neighborhood. So I would ask all of you, as people who have to make difficult decisions, to expect people who lead your governmental institutions to do the same thing and to be perfectly willing to be held accountable for the consequences of them. And that brings me to the budget issue. Let me say what this is not about, this squabble in Washington. It is not. I say again, it is not about balancing the budget. 
There are two plans to balance the budget, both of which have been blessed as perfectly credible by every neutral observer. Our plan would now, we know, would balance the budget in nine years and continue to increase investment in education, research and development, technology, and the environment. It would invest enough in things like the Commerce Department, the State Department, and our aid programs to maintain our world leadership, which is very important. You see what happens when we have a chance to exercise it. It would lengthen the life of the Medicare Trust Fund just as much as the Republican budget. It would slow the rate of medical inflation, but not as much as their budget. Why? Because nobody I know in the healthcare field believes that we can take $450 billion out of Medicare and Medicaid over the next seven years based on what we now know without causing serious problems to the medical schools of the country, to the children's hospitals of the country, to the ability of the elderly poor to get into nursing homes or their middle class children to have them there and afford to educate their children. And devastating problems to our ability to care for the over 20 percent of America's children who are so poor they qualify for medical assistance under the Medicaid program. We do have to slow the rate of medical inflation. I've been working at this for two years. We do have to bail out the Medicare Trust Fund. But we have to recognize that we have to listen to the people who do this for a living and have some sense of the p practical implications of how much we can cut. My budget has a tax cut, but it's smaller than the congressional one. The congressional budget balances the budget in seven years. It cuts education, research and development, technology, investment in the environment. It drastically cuts back on our ability to exercise world leadership through the Commerce Department, the State Department, and the aid programs. The tax cut they offer is bigger, and there's a big tax increase on the lower income working poor, a big one. I think one of our values ought to be to grow the middle class and shrink the underclass. I think it's not a very good idea on the edge of the 21st century to grow the underclass and shrink the middle class. That is not my idea of what kind of country I want my child and her children to grow up in. So can we resolve this? You bet we can. Here's the practical thing. This is what I want to ask you to do. There are four or five big issues where there's a lot of money involved. One is we differ on how much we estimate we'll grow. I picked a conservative figure, 2.5%, because that's what the economy has grown for the last 25 years. They said, oh, no, we're not going to grow that fast. Well, why are we balancing the budget and giving a capital gains tax cut and doing all this stuff if we think we're going to get lower growth than we've had for the last 25 years? I don't want to argue it either way, but I mean, I think my growth estimate is not a rosy scenario. It is lower than what a lot of you pay for. The blue chip forecast is for a higher economic growth and therefore more revenues than I estimate. Then we are arguing about the rate of medical inflation. Then there's the question of whether we should reassign or redesign and recalculate the amount of inflation in the consumer price index, which determines how much we increase Social Security and retirement. And we're talking about the size of the tax cut. I, we can work this out, folks. The only thing I won't do, I will not do this, I will not let balancing the budget serve as a cover for destroying the social compact, for cutting back on education, wrecking the environment, or undermining our obligations to help protect our children, and treat our elderly people decently, because it is not necessary to balance the budget. Now, I don't want you to take my side or theirs on any of these big questions. Here's what I'm asking you to do. What I want is to get together with the Congress and get a budget out that is a, an honorable compromise that is better than theirs and better than mine. That's the best kind of get together, where everybody puts their ideas together and you come out with something that's better than what anybody had. I don't have the, the, I'm not the source of all wisdom, but I know this, there's not a single one of you looking at the 21st century and the position of your company that would knowingly cut back on research and development or investment in technology or education and training. You wouldn't do it, not if you didn't have to, and we don't have to. So all I'm asking you to do is to say, just get together, Come up with something. If you do it in good faith, it'll be better than the president's budget, and it'll be better than the Congress's budget. 
Because when people get together, that's what they do. I am prepared to make some decisions that I think are right over the long run. And I believe they are. There is no earthly reason why we shouldn't do this. America needs and deserves a balanced budget. America needs and deserves a balanced budget consistent with our values that will give us the kind of world that we would be proud to have our children and our grandchildren and their children grow up in. This country is doing well, and it's going to do better. And a lot of it is because of what you are doing, and a lot of it is because of what mayors are doing all over the country, and a lot of it is because of what plain old American citizens are doing. We are moving in the right direction, and there is no country on earth better positioned to do well in the 21st century than the United States of America. And ironically, all we have to do to get there, I believe, is to be faithful to our basic values and what we know is right. That's a commitment I make to you, and I'm asking you tonight to do what you can, because you have more influence with both of those folks than I do, to make sure that we get together and do this, do it right, do it for America, and do it for the future. Thank you very much. The president will be on the road for a good part of the week, attending policy and campaign functions in Texas and forums in Ohio and Iowa. The first lady is on a five-day trip to Latin America. In a moment, we'll show you a speech by former Secretary of State James Baker. First, a couple of programming notes. Tonight on our companion network, C-SPAN, this week's Republican Presidential Candidates Forum. The GOP contenders met in New Hampshire Wednesday evening to outline their views on campaign issues. We air the program Sunday at 5.30 p.m. Eastern Time, 2.30 Pacific. After that, the latest developments on the road to the White House. This week, Senator Richard Lugar on the radio in Concord, New Hampshire. Road to the White House, tonight at 7 and 10 p.m. Eastern and Pacific Time, also on C-SPAN. Next, James Baker, former Secretary of State in the Bush administration. He spoke Wednesday at the National Press Club about U.S. foreign policy. Mr. Baker also talked about his book titled The Politics of Diplomacy. A question and answer period follows his remarks. This event runs an hour. Good afternoon and welcome to the National Press Club. My name is Monroe Carmen. I am president of the club and editor-at-large at Bloomberg Business News. I'd like to welcome our club members and their guests in the audience, as well as those of you watching on C-SPAN or listening to this program on National Public Radio or the Global Internet Computer Network. Uh, before introducing our head table, I'd like to remind our members of coming speakers. On Tuesday, October 17th, Don Hewitt, executive producer of 60 Minutes, will be here to address us, and I'm sure we'll be asked some In a moment, we'll show you a program on campaign advertising and the political process. But first, here are a couple of programming notes. On our companion network, C-SPAN, this week's Republican Presidential Candidates Forum. The GOP contenders met in New Hampshire Wednesday evening to outline their views on campaign issues. We'll air the program Sunday at 5.30 p.m. Eastern Time. 2.30 Pacific. Also on Sunday, here on C-SPAN 2, African American Men and Society, a forum hosted by Howard University. 
panelists discuss the status of African American men in today's society and examine a recent report by the Federal Sentencing Commission. Sunday at 11 a.m. Eastern Time, 8 a.m. Pacific. C-SPAN 2, a public service created by America's cable t television companies. Here's the schedule for C-SPAN 2 for the next several hours. All times are Eastern. Next, MIT professor Noam Chomsky on social and and economic policy. Following that, a speech by, by NAACP Chairman Merle e. Evers Williams. She spoke recently at the, the Anti Defamation League Award dinner for the late Supreme Court Justice Thurgood Marshall. Then, Actor Charlton Heston on politics and culture. Later, you'll hear from the chairman of the President's Committee on the Arts and Humanities on federal funding of the arts. And that's the schedule here on C-SPAN 2. Next, MIT professor Noam Chomsky on social and economic policy. This event was hosted recently by the Vineyard Peace Council and lasted an hour. Okay, um, we have a very special guest tonight, Professor Noam Chomsky, um, who's... <laughs> Professor Chomsky. Thanks, and thanks for your patience as well. Uh, well, I don't know if the title that was sent to me was al also announced, but if it was, you'll have noticed that it covers about every imaginable base, so I guess I can talk about anything. Uh, what I'd like to do is to say a few words about where, the where I think the United States is going, uh, or to be more accurate, where it's being driven by quite deliberate and conscious social policy, uh, taking advantage of significant changes that have occurred in the uh, international economy and the global system uh, during the past 20, 25 years. Now, I'm going to keep to the United States, but the comments that I want to make extend in various degrees to other uh, rich societies, uh, the societies that commonly uh, indulge in the self-adulation that's one of the prerogatives of power, uh, but occasionally are described accurately, very occasionally. Uh, for example, once by Winston Churchill uh, at the height of British imperial power right before the First World War, uh, when he, uh, there we got a little background, uh, he was speaking to the British cabinet 
uh, and he pointed out calling for rearmament, and he uh, said, we have got all we want in territory and wish only to be left alone in unmolested enjoyment of vast and splendid possessions, mainly acquired by violence, largely maintained by force, uh, and then he says, this often seems less reasonable than, to others than it does to us, uh, <laughs> for some reason, which means that various measures have to be taken to teach reasonableness. Uh, well, Churchill was alert enough to realize that that's not for the public ears, so that was a secret cabinet meeting. And when parts of it uh, did reach the public about 20 years later, it was carefully sanitized, but has emerged 75 years later in uh, released documents. And maybe if one were to explore documents more carefully, you might even find some accurate descriptions in our internal record. Uh, well, uh, what seemed unreasonable to others uh, also seemed quite unreasonable to more humane uh, people in Imperial England some of them quite well known. Uh, for example, Adam Smith, uh, 200 years ago, 1776, who denounced what he called the savage injustice of the Europeans, who were then devastating much of the world, uh, and in fact creating the first world, third world division uh, that exists today, and doing it with ample savagery, as Adam Smith uh, understood. Uh, and uh, as he condemned. And he also understood something else that Churchill didn't mention in these remarks, namely that there's a domestic analog. That is, the we who uh, want to enjoy uh, their vast and splendid possessions uh, were not the people of England or the people of France or America or others, but rather a sector among, among them, uh, those who Smith described as the uh, principal architects of policy who used their power, their control over the economy, uh, to uh, design policy so that it would be, uh, so that their own interests would be, as he put it, most peculiarly attended to, uh, no matter how grievous the impact on others, including the people of England. He spoke particularly of the manufacturers and merchants of England who were designing, using power to design state policy in this fashion, uh, following what he called the vile maxim of the masters of mankind, uh, all for ourselves and nothing for anyone else. Uh, recall that Adam Smith, there's a mythical Adam Smith who you're taught about, and there's a real one who was saying things like this. Uh, he was a pre-capitalist thinker with roots in the Enlightenment, and he regarded all of this as outrageous. Uh, and he also insisted on uh, uh, relative equality of condition as an elementary principle of justice and morality, a position in which he was joined by Benjamin Franklin and James Madison and Thomas Jefferson uh, and, and authentic conservatives like de Tocqueville years later, uh, all of whom also recognized that it's a prerequisite for anything remotely like democracy. Uh, these were truisms. Uh, hundreds of years ago, and they remain true today, even though they're regularly denied. Uh, well, these same issues arose uh, very prominently uh, at the foundation of this country, among the founding fathers of American democracy, uh, at pretty much the same time. A few years later, 10 years later, in 1787, at the Constitutional Convention, uh, James Madison, who was basically the main framer of the Constitution, uh, emphasized to the convention that the first priority of government must be, as he put it, to protect the minority of the opulent against the majority. Uh, and in fact, the system was designed very specifically and consciously to that end. Uh, power had to be placed in the hands of the owners of property, Madison insisted, uh, so that uh, the minority, the opul opulent, could be projected, protected against uh, the majority in a formally democratic system. That's the way it was designed, and that's the way it remained. Now, Madison had a rather naive belief that the minority of the opulent would behave as enlightened, uh, civilized gentlemen, like the uh, Republican uh, Romans of his imagination 
uh, imagination, I stress. Uh, but he soon discovered that that uh, reality was pretty far from, uh, the reality was quite different. And within a few years, seeing what had happened, uh, Madison deplored what he called the daring depravity of the times as the wealthy came to use their control of government exactly as Adam Smith had described, uh, to put it in, uh, uh, well, using Madison's own words, uh, he said, the stock jobbers are becoming the Praetorian band of government, at once its tool and its tyrant, bribed by its largesses and overawing it by its clamors and combinations. Uh, earlier in this century, the same thought was put more simply by America's leading social philosopher, John Dewey, who pointed out that politics is the shadow cast by big business over society, uh, and as long as the substance isn't changed, attenuation of the shadow, the th changes at the margins, uh, will be useful but limited. Uh, let me stress that these are truisms. They've been truisms for 200 years, uh, and they're truisms that are well to bear in mind. Well, these struggles, struggles between the minority of the opulent and the majority, uh, which were well understood 200 years ago by leading thinkers who were supposed to revere but not read, uh, they remain the uh, leading themes of history. Uh, uh, and it's worth, I think it's pertinent today to remember how they've been played out over the years. Obviously, I can't run through that, but I'll mention a few points which I think are worth bearing in mind. Uh, in the mid-19th century in the United States, uh, there was a lively and vigorous uh, independent labor press, uh, mainly in places like not too far from here. In fact, the uh, Lawrence and Lowell and the working class towns of northeastern United States where the Industrial Revolution was taking place. And indeed, that independent labor press remained for a long time. As late as the 1950s, there were still about 800 labor newspapers reaching about 30 million people. Later, they were, that was the tail end. After that, they were wiped out by concentrations of corporate capital. And they're very interesting reading. Uh, the, uh, the press was run by working people by what they called factory girls, young women off the farms uh, who were working in the Lowell Mills or artisans and mechanics. And they denounced what they called the new spirit of the age, gain wealth for getting all but self. In other words, Smith's vile maxim, uh, which they called a demeaning and a degrading doctrine that was destroying the revolutionary heritage of the United States, destroying democratic rights, uh, destroying elementary human values, even destroying uh, their surprisingly high cultural level of those days, all exactly as Adam Smith and James Madison and particularly Thomas Jefferson had warned would happen. Uh, these conflicts, uh, the conflict of ordinary people with the new spirit of the age, continued, uh, have continued right up until the present. There have been many victories for freedom and democracy and human rights. Uh, they have been gained by often quite bitter struggle, and there have been many periods of decline and uh, defeat. Uh, and again, that cycle is well to remember. About 100 years ago, the famous uh, artisan, radical artisan William Morris in England wrote, I know that it is the received opinion that the competitive devil take the hindmost system that now prevails is perfection, uh, and therefore finality has been reached in it. But if history is really at an end in this devil take the mind hindmost system, this vile system as he described it, then civilization will die. Uh, however, he went on to say that despite the opinion of learned men that history is at an end, uh, all of history says that this is not so. Uh, the claim, tr claims have been made before, unfortunately were false. Uh, and he was right. The struggle continued, continued with victories and defeats. Uh, in the United States, the repression of uh, working people was unusually violent and severe by international standards. It scandalized even the right-wing British and other European press. Uh, by the 1920s, the opulent minority again believed that history was at an end, that perfection was in sight, 
uh, in the United States and that the vile maxim that Smith condemned could rule unchallenged. Uh, Woodrow Wilson's Red Scare, the end of World War I, <coughs> had pretty much demolished and destroyed the union movement, the labor movement, had undermined independent thought, and it had established an era of business dominance uh, that was expected at that time to be permanent. Uh, working people had no power and very little hope at the peak of the automobile boom of the 1920s, the big industrial development. Uh, any rights that they had were at the tolerance of employers, uh, one foreign visitor observed with some amazement comparing the United States with comparable countries. Uh, the leading labor historian in the United States, Yale University professor David Montgomery, comments correctly that modern America was created over the protests of its working people, vigorous and outspoken protests and fierce struggles, as he puts it, with hard-won victories, but also periods of forced accommodation to a most undemocratic America, uh, notably in the 1920s. Uh, well, again, the predictions of the end of history uh, were proven wrong. Within a few years, popular struggles had considerably extended human rights and democracy, uh, even gaining for working people in the United States the rights that they had achieved decades earlier throughout most of the industrial world in Europe, Australia, and elsewhere. Well, uh, the achievement of those rights during the 30s, in the struggles of the 30s, uh, that gave rise very quickly to new conflicts as the minority of the opulent uh, sought to contain these achievements. Uh, in fact, the achievement of ordinary, what had long been regarded as ordinary rights for working people in the 1930s, the achievement of that in the United States uh, set off real fury in the organized business community. The National Association of Manufacturers uh, reacted uh, by warning of what it called the hazard-facing industrialists uh, in the rising political power of the masses. Uh, incidentally, if that terminology surprises you and sounds like a Maoist text, uh, you have to remember that the business community is uh, vulgar Marxist, as is the government just with the values reversed, and that kind of terminology about the rising political power of the masses and all that sort of thing is perfectly standard in government documents and business press. Uh, there, they see themselves as fighting a vicious class war and always have. Uh, uh, the evidence on that is overwhelming. Uh, well, they, were wor they warned that uh, unless the thinking of the masses is redirected, uh, we will uh, be facing a disaster. Uh, and in fact, a serious counterattack was launched uh, right at, in the late 1930s. It was put on hold during the war, but picked up with great vigor uh, after World War II. There was a s quite spectacular campaign, propaganda and everything else, uh, to try to overcome the rising political power of the masses uh, and uh, uh, to, to save our preferred way of life, as business leaders put it. Uh, they described the task as uh, continuing with the everlasting battle for the minds of men. Uh, we have to uh, indoctrinate people with the capitalist story. We have three to five years, it was uh, claimed, to save our American, what they called our American way of life against this rising political power of the masses. And a huge campaign was undertaken uh, the scale of it is pretty spectacular. By the early 1950s, uh, about one-third of the uh, materials in schools around the country were being provided by business as straight business propaganda. Uh, about 20 million people a week were watching propaganda films. Uh, the resources of the entertainment industry were mobilized uh, to try to uh, portray, uh, there were several major goals. One was to portray uh, unions as the enemy of the working people. Uh, on the waterfront, uh, Marlon Brando's uh, famous example, you know, honest working man stands up against tough union bosses and everyone ends up happy uh, to create a picture of a harmony and Americanism, meaning uh, the hardworking executive and the sober workman and the housewife busy taking care of the kids all together 
uh, against these outsiders who are trying to cause disruption by organizing people and getting them to try to fight for their rights and so on and so forth. The campaign was extraordinary in scale. Uh, it attacked, it uh, targeted the churches, the schools, the universities, even recreational programs uh, to win the everlasting battle for the minds of men uh, and to uh, indoctrinate people with the capitalist story and to try to get one crucial part of it, which has a lot of resonance today, uh, is to try to get people to hate the government. Uh, there's a good reason for that. Uh, the government, whatever you think of, even though the business knew as well as anybody that government is the uh, uh, shadow cast by big business over society, nevertheless, government has a fatal flaw that corporate power doesn't have. Uh, in principle, it's possible for people to participate in it and to influence it. In contrast, corporations are private tyrannies. They are totalitarian in structure. They're unaccountable. Uh, and there's no way for the population to become involved in their decisions or even to know what they are. Government, however well controlled by the substance behind the shadow, has the flaw that it is potentially democratic. And therefore, it makes good sense to try to direct people's hatred and anger and fear and so on against government and to keep the shadow, the substance behind it, very well hidden. Uh, that is the main theme of uh, the massive propaganda uh, to which people are subjected from every point of view. And the end result is the mood that's called anti-politics. Uh, if you're angry, and you have good reasons to be angry for most of the population, direct it against the gov government, not against the Fortune 500. Just pay attention to the shadow, not the substance. Uh, that and the attack on efforts of people to organize uh, and to realize the rising, the potential rising political power of the masses, those are the major themes of uh, very spectacular propaganda campaigns. Uh, there's actually some pretty good uh, uh, scholarly work that's just come out in the last couple of years on these topics, and I thought I knew something about it, but it's pretty remarkable to see what the scale was and the self-consciousness. Well, that had its effects. Uh, we're, again, now in one of those periods uh, uh, when uh, uh, the end of history is being predicted once again. Uh, we're in the midst of an era, era of a kind of rollback, uh, a very vigorous attack on freedom and uh, human rights and democratic values, and even an attack on markets, contrary to what's being claimed. And it's well to bear in mind the lessons of history, which are rich uh, and valuable. Uh, the utopia of the masters, guided by the vile maxim, uh, that's been proclaimed over and over again always wrongly, uh, because people have always found ways uh, to get together uh, and to struggle for decent human values. And there's no reason to believe today that, that uh, civilization will die and that what Madison called the depravity of the times uh, will be permanent. Again, a good look at history shows that things aren't all that different than they've been before and the hopes that were realized before can be again. Well, another accurate description of the rich countries, the so-called developed world, can be read alongside of Churchill's, uh, was given a couple of weeks ago by uh, Carol Bellamy. She's the new director of UNICEF, uh, an American, of course, appointed as usual under uh, quite considerable strong U.S. pressure. Uh, but uh, she released uh, the latest uh, UNICEF annual report uh, on State of the World's Children, in which she concluded, the report concluded, that 13 million children die every year from malnutrition and easily treatable diseases. That's up from about 11 million a few years ago. Uh, these are lives that could be saved with pennies of aid. Uh, the report went on to say that tens of millions of children uh, could be saved from mental retardation uh, and physical disaster at a cost that they estimate at five cents per person per year in the rich countries. Well, uh, that wasn't reported in the national press. However, the press did report that on the same day, uh, Congress had called for a cut of one-third in the U.S. funds for UN agencies, including UNICEF, so 
maybe if we're lucky, this, that can go up to maybe uh, 20 million a year in another year or two. Uh, and also call it for uh, terminating, or mostly eliminating foreign aid. Uh, the United States already has the most miserly record in the developed world, and long has. Uh, and if you put aside the aid, the biggest component of aid, which happens to go to a very rich country, namely Israel, uh, if you eliminate that, uh, then we're just off the spectrum, uh, completely off the spectrum of developed societies. Uh, that timing was fortuitous, but you wouldn't have known it unless you somehow f found out that UNICEF had a press conference that day. Uh, well, this is by no means a response to public opinion. Uh, quite the contrary. Public opinion continues to show what the pollsters point out are strong majorities, uh, not only in favor of foreign aid, if it reaches the poor, but of uh, even for increased strong majorities in favor of increased taxes for, foreign, for more foreign aid that reaches the poor. This is only one example of a very consistent pattern in the last couple of months that the allegedly poll-driven policies that are being undertaken are radically opposed to the opinions of the general population. But uh, they are favored by the minority of the opulent, uh, and therefore they are being put through. And if you look just at the headlines, you'll think that the public supports them. Uh, that's true in case after case, in fact, almost without exception. Uh, take the biggest case, the b balanced budget at efforts. Every, you know, the headlines repeatedly tell you, yeah, people strongly in favor of a balanced budget, we have to push that through. Well, there's a sense in that in which that's true. Uh, if you ask people, would you like to have a balanced budget, people would say, sure, you know, me too. So you get very high numbers in support of a balanced budget. If you ask people, would you like to have all your household debts canceled by magic, they'd say, yeah, terrific. You know, so people are in favor of canceling household debts. Uh, on the other hand, uh, if you go down below the headline and you look at the data and you ask the sensible question, uh, which is down there maybe somewhere at the end of the column or maybe no, not, uh, if you ask people, would you, do you want a balanced budget if it's going to mean cuts in education uh, or health or environmental protection and so on, then the figures go down to like 20% in favor or maybe 25% in favor. Uh, so in other words, there's overwhelming opposition to the only serious question. Uh, but that you're not supposed to notice. You know. And since the minority, the opulent, are in favor of it as a technique of destroying even the quite limited, by comparative standards, quite limited uh, welfare systems in the United States, it's being rammed through. Uh, and the same in case after case after case, if you look carefully. Well, uh, again, there's a domestic analog to what uh, UNICEF reported about uh, uh, the suffering of children throughout the world because of lack of pennies of aid. Uh, the domestic analog is right here. It's one aspect of the pro project that's now underway to try to turn the United States itself into a kind of a third world society. Uh, it's not going to be, it's a rich, very super rich country, so it's not going to look like Brazil or Mexico, but to impose the structure of a third world society that is a sector of great opulence. Uh, a large number of people who are suffering or maybe miserable, and then a huge mass of people who are just superfluous, uh, who people who contribute nothing to profit making, which is the only human value, and therefore have no human rights. Well, if it's one of our, say, dependencies, like, say, Colombia or some place like that, uh, you just kill them or you send out the death squads, you carry out social cleansing or something, like, something of that sort. In a more civilized country like ours, uh, what you do is uh, coop them up into urban slums, which increasingly resemble concentration camps in which they can prey on one another, or just throw them in jail. Uh, the prison population is, w through the 1980s, it used to be about, at the, about 1980, it was more at the, less at the level of other countries. Uh, it more than tripled during the 1980s, it's still going up. Uh, there isn't any other country in the developed world, or in fact anywhere in the world, it's even close to it, in per capita imprisonment, except for one. Uh, Russia just caught up with us uh, after the, they picked up American values after 1989. Uh, but aside from that example, we're uh, way ahead of everyone else. Well, that's the sort of civilized equivalent of uh, death squads and social cleansing. And in fact, if you, it's not that crime has gone up. Crime is pretty stable. 
uh, has been stable for about 20 years, which is serious, but hadn't changed, maybe even declining. But there is a superfluous population. They've got to be controlled. And plenty of people gain by this, remember. Uh, this has become a big industry. Uh, private prison systems are now pretty wealthy operations. They're privatized, of course, like everything else. Uh, you, uh, meaning more profit can be made. Uh, in fact, there was a big article in the Wall Street Journal about it about a year ago, pointing out that the big investment firms uh, are making lots of money floating bonds for new prisons, uh, Merrill Lynch and the rest of them. And furthermore, that high-tech industry, the mil military industry, what's mislabeled defense industry, has realized that they can get in the act. Here's another cash cow, you know, another form of public subsidy to high-tech industry alongside the p smaller than the Pentagon, but still substantial and growing, uh, which they can get into by uh, selling uh, high-tech surveillance techniques, you know, sticking electrodes in people and monitoring them with supercomputers and so on and so forth. Uh, other kinds of scams of the sort that have kept high-tech industry going at the public expense. So it's another form of Keynesian stimulation of the economy, public subsidy of private profit, and can be expected to grow because of these various contributions to social welfare. Well, as part of this uh, process of, tr of trying to create a sort of a model of the third world in a super rich society, which you can't miss walking through any American city now, begins to look more and more like third world cities. Uh, one part of the process is the domestic analog of the attack on children uh, throughout the world, uh, and the, or, or simply the domestic analog of malnutrition and starvation throughout the world. The United States is without parallel in a developed world in the level of uh, malnutrition and often starvation. Uh, it reached about 30 million people uh, by 1990, including 12 million children, and one out of six of the elderly, uh, many of whom are literally starving, the Wall Street Journal pointed out in an article that year. Uh, remember, this is the richest country in the world with absolutely unparalleled advantages. I mean, the idea that anybody is starving is a scandal, uh, but the levels are way beyond anything else in the developed world. Uh, in uh, uh, the, uh, th this is only 1990, 1991, that's before the Bush recession, which made things even worse, uh, and the Clinton recovery, which was historically unique uh, in that it's the first time that median wages, real wages, continued to decline. That's a decline that's been going on since 1980. They continued to decline right through the recovery. They're still declining right now, maybe even faster. Uh, in uh, the uh, poverty level in the United States is about double that of comparably rich societies. Children, poverty among children is about triple the level of other societies. Uh, the uh, uh, the, all, the welfare system is extremely limited as compared with other comparable societies, and one effect of that is that the effect of government spending reduces child poverty much less than it does in other societies, far less, and in, during the Reagan years went down far, way below what it had been. Uh, it, take New York City, the richest city in the world. Uh, Forty percent of children uh, are now below the poverty line. That means lacking sufficient food to maintain growth and development in many cases. Uh, inequality in Manhattan uh, is now greater than Guatemala. Those of you who know what Central America is like will know what that means. Uh, in Boston, which is another rich city, the city hospital, the one that's deal that's offers services to the poor people or though it probably won't pretty soon because they're being eliminated. Uh, it had to establish a malnutrition clinic a couple of years ago for the first time ever because it was dealing with third world levels of malnutrition among children, which got much worse over the winter, not surprisingly, when parents had to make the agonizing decision as to whether to feed the children or uh, heat their houses. It's unheard of in developed societies. Uh, the uh, there are now tens of millions of people who lack health insurance. That's increasing. As I mentioned, the crime rate has been stable or even declining for about 20 years, but the prison population is booming. Uh, support systems for the poor have declined very sharply since the, last, since the 1970s. Uh, if you take, say, 
AFDC, the one everyone talks about, Aid for Families with Dependent Children, uh, that's been cut by about half since, since the early 1970s. It was already very low by international standards to begin with. It's now being cut very sharply. Uh, maybe another five or set to seven million children will be knocked off the rolls. Uh, kids aged about, average age about seven, who have to learn responsibility, we're told. Uh, the uh, 1980s were a period of relative, there was some economic growth, relatively low by post-war standards, but there was some. About 60% of the new wealth that was created went to the top 1% of the population, and about 40% of families declined in absolute terms during this period. Uh, median real wages uh, have declined steadily since 1980, right until today. Uh, the, uh, for, for the majority of workers, that means men with only without college education, uh, real income has declined over 20% since 1980. That's the source of the famous angry white male syndrome that you hear about. Uh, since 1987, it took a couple of years for the Reagan reforms to come in, but they, by 1987 they were hitting even college-educated people, and their college-educated wages started going down in 1987. Uh, most striking has been the decline in entry-level wages, the wages that you get when you first get a job. You know. uh, that's declined 30% for males, 18% for females since 1980. Uh, that's a portent of the future. Meanwhile, working hours are going up. Uh, there's a, people are working an average of uh, about two weeks per year over what they were in 1980. Uh, the effect of these changes has been to drive lots of women into the workforce. Uh, daycare or any other kind of child care is impossibly expensive. Uh, the United States does not have the support systems for parents that other countries have. So, for example, parental leave for childbirth is way lower than other countries. In fact, it's lower, just to give you an example, it's lower than the standards for plantation workers in Uganda at the moment. And remember, this is the richest country in the world. Uh, the effect of all of this is uh, that people are doing it simply because there's no other way to provide food for their kids. You want to provide food, you work 50-hour weeks, two parents. Otherwise, no way, with wages going down and uh, benefits going down and uh, uh, working hours going up. And you have no choices because there's no unions. They've been destroyed, so there's no chance of organizing to react to this. Uh, the, uh, and since there's no very limited daycare and other support system, kids are just left alone. Uh, one effect is that contact time between parents and children has declined about 40% in the last generation. That's substantial, high quality contact time even more. Uh, the kids, kids are left alone. You get latchkey children, so-called television supervision, with the obvious effects, uh, violence by children, against children, uh, drug abuse, uh, breakdown of families, and so on. Uh, it's no secret. Uh, all of this has been studied in detail, for example, by in a recent UNICEF report written by a well-known American economist, Sylviane Hewlett, uh, who compared the way in which the, the, the rich societies, it's called child neglect in rich societies, in which the rich societies were developing, dealing with the problems that all faced since the 1970s. She found two quite different models as an Anglo-American what she called neglect-filled model, which has been a disaster for children and families, and a European-Japanese model, which, facing the same conditions, improved their already better circumstances considerably during the same period. Uh, this is a deliberate war, deliberate war against families and children, uh, which has been, amazingly enough, carried out under the banner of family values. Uh, and conservatism, that's a real tribute to the educated classes to be able to pull that one off, uh, as is the fact that the studies of the topic, like the UNICEF study uh, and others like it, are unreviewed, unmentionable. Uh, try to find a mention of them. As far as I know, the only mention that exists is in an article of mine in Z Magazine on when the UNICEF study came out. Uh, they're just not part of the debate because this is not the right thing to think about if you want to fight the uh, everlasting battle uh, to control the minds of men. Uh, well, like I say, that's a tribute to the educated classes, the classes that we're parts of. Uh, the official story 
uh, which you hear over and over again, is that these are lean and mean times, and we all have to tighten our belts. Uh, that is total hogwash. The country is absolutely awash in capital. Uh, the, uh, while median wages have been going down uh, in the manner that I described, corporate salaries, uh, for example, uh, executive pay has, has risen 66% during the same period. Uh, capital gains are up about the same amount, 66%. Uh, they now form about half the income of the top 1% of the population. Incidentally, if these new flat tax proposals that are being tossed about go through, that won't even be taxable, which means half of the income for the top 1% will be tax-free. Uh, this is uh, uh, the ratio of corporate pay, executive pay, to manufacturing workers' pay is far higher in the United States than any other uh, developed country. Uh, and the enormous increase in the last years is essentially close to unparalleled except in England. Uh, the uh, business press, of course, is totally euphoric about this. You don't read about le lean and mean times in Business Week and Fortune and so on, or Financial Times. Quite the contrary. They're euphoric. Uh, they have headlines like Fortune a couple of weeks ago on why profits will keep booming. Uh, an article, lead article, which points out that in 1993, profits were dazzling despite, I'm quoting it, stagnant, virtually stagnant sales and continuing decline of wages. 1994, they say, was even more splendid. Uh, it was the fourth straight year of double-digit profit growth, uh, and they expect it to continue <coughs> at least until 1996. Uh, meanwhile, there's an, there's an annual study called The State of Working America, the main scholarly study of working people in the country, and it predicts, Michelle and Bernstein, that uh, wages will continue their decline while profits continue this completely unprecedented growth. Our earnings per share have doubled since 1991. Return on capital has more than doubled since 1980. Uh, it's not that business was without problems. So you can read a headline in Business Week saying the problem now, what to do with all that cash? Uh, as surging profits are overflowing the coffers of corporate America and dividends are booming, uh, thanks in large measure to profits from overseas operations. That's what's called uh, working for jobs for Americans when you listen to it. Uh, there's a well-oiled profit machine, another article says, they're reporting the first quarter of 1995, which had a 30% leap in profits, which is pretty spectacular, although they say less than the phenomenal 74% advance of the last quarter of 1994. Uh, the Fortune 500, which comes out every year with a big study of the top 500 corporations, uh, this year, May 15th, was absolutely ecstatic. Uh, profits, they said, were up a stunning, I'm quoting it, stunning 54% on a sales growth of 8% and employment growth of 2.6% and declining wages. Uh, the, uh, it's one of the most profitable years ever for American business, uh, and this series of increasing profit is unprecedented. Uh, the revenues of the for for Fortune 500, they say, now constitute 63% of total gross domestic product in the United States. That's more than Germany, more than the United Kingdom. Uh, in addition to that, this huge control over the international economy. And so there's a degree of power over the inter international and domestic society uh, in the hands of real totalitarian in institutions. Because remember, these are private, unaccountable tyrannies that's, I think, without precedent hard to find a precedent for that, and it's going up. Uh, it's interesting to look at the particular cases. Uh, if you look at the Fortune 500 list, you'll find that some of the biggest uh, increases are one of the biggest uh, increases in what they call sales is manpower incorporated. By sales, they mean selling people to as temporary workers. They provide temporary replacement workers. Uh, their sales increased 35%. Kelly, the next biggest one, not much less than that way up on the Fortune 500, one of the biggest employers now. Uh, the point of that is to make labor markets what are called flexible. If you study economics, you learn that it's good for labor markets to be flexible and to avoid market rigidities. Those are fancy words which mean that it's bad for the economy if people can go to sleep at night and with any confidence that they're going to have a job the next day. 
Uh, that is bad for something that's called economic health. That's another technical term, which has nothing to do with the health of the economy, but has a lot to do with the um, health of the uh, minority, the opulent. So uh, labor markets are getting a lot more flexible, and they're eliminating rigidities like contracts and uh, expectation of a job and, uh, you know, uh, uh, that sort of uh, thing, which we all know is terribly bad. Uh, another one that... Uh, Another corporation, an interesting one that shot way up last year was Caterpillar, uh, up, profits up 46%, uh, dividends up about the same amount. That's extremely important because right now in Decatur, Illinois, uh, one of the most important labor actions of modern, maybe all of American history, certainly modern American history is going on. A major effort by three major corporations, Caterpillar, one British-owned multinational and a Japanese-owned multinational, uh, to destroy, really destroy the last, what there is left of American industrial unions. Uh, and the Caterpillar Corporation has explained, uh, very kind enough to explain its strategy, to the, which the business press reports, namely they, want to they have been using their enormous profits uh, to develop excess capacity overseas, not for reasons of economic efficiency, but for reasons of class warfare. Because if you develop excessive excess capacity in Brazil or uh, Japan or Europe, and then there's a strike in Decatur, Illinois, you can fill your market orders uh, from those from the excess capacity and therefore undermine and destroy the workers in Decatur, Illinois. Well, that's a good way to drive the third to turn the country into a third world country. Uh, in the in 1985, uh, labor costs, which means essentially wages and benefits in the United States were the highest in the developed world, exactly as you would expect in the richest and most privileged country in the world. Uh, by 1990, thanks to the Reaganite measures, including the really criminal destruction of unions in which they simply, the government simply told employers they're not going to enforce the law, so do anything you feel like. Uh, the, uh, by 1990, the United States had reached the lowest level in the developed world. Uh, it was then passed by England in the competition to see who can crush working people most. And by 1992, it was second lowest in the developed world, one of the reasons Thatcher is so admired here. Uh, the Wall Street Journal had an article on that describing it as a welcome development of transcendent importance, which indeed it is for the minority, the opulent. Uh, the international business press has pointed out that international conditions make it offer new ways to do to achieve this. Not only can say General Motors uh, either send or threaten to send production down to Mexico and Brazil and so on, but now they've got a new third world, or rather an old third world that has be been returned to Western control, namely Eastern Europe. It's a good bit of what the Cold War was about. Uh, and now, of course, things in Eastern Europe are terrible, the press points out, but there was an article in Financial Times, which is the major international business press, called uh, Green Shoots in Communism's Ruins, saying, well, you know, it's pretty rotten, but there's some green shoots, there's some good things. The green shoots turn out to be, as they put it, that, the, that with the economic reforms, so-called, the pauperization and, uh, of workers and the unemployment has reached such high levels that Western corporations can now get workers uh, in Eastern Europe at 10% the wages of the pampered Western workers. Uh, who will have to give up their luxurious lifestyles, as Business Week chimed in. Uh, well, as I say, that tells you a lot about what the Cold War was about. Uh, well, this is a picture of what's going on. There are no lean and mean times. There's plenty of capital. It's just being very highly concentrated uh, in the right hands, uh, the hands of the minority of the opulent. Well, what should we do in the face of these catastrophic consequences of uh, contemporary state capitalism. Uh, the press has told us, so the New York Times a little while back had a first page, front page story uh, with a headline that read, uh, New York is simply not wealthy enough to afford services to the general public. Uh, read on. The source uh, for this insight uh, was an expert opinion, uh, namely a report to investors by the J.P. Morgan Corporation uh, which is fifth among the banks in the Fortune 500, suffering from a mere $1.2 billion in profits last year. 
which incidentally is actually rather low as compared with its competitors who did far better, so we've got a, uh, some tears for them. So the report to investors to, uh, uh, of J.P. Morgan, which made it to the headline of the front page of the Times, says New York is simply not wealthy enough uh, to afford services to the general public. So what's the solution? Well, the solution is to cut taxes uh, on the rich. Uh, again, the small print in the back pages pointed out that all the tax cuts benefit business. So you cut taxes on the rich, but you increase taxes on the poor. Except you don't call them on everybody else. That's not the poor. That's the great majority. You increase taxes on everybody else, but you don't call them taxes. That's very important for those of you who are looking for you know, employment in serious places. You raise taxes, but you don't call them taxes. What you call them is, I'm quoting, multi-million dollar reductions in subsidies for cities' ma mass transit and aid to education and higher education, to education and higher education. Incidentally, the word subsidies is kind of interesting. Uh, if the population of New York City decides to use their money to improve their public transportation system, that's a subsidy. But let's put that aside. Uh, by the multi-million dollar reductions in the subsidies to mass transit and ed education, you simply increase the costs for the people who use mass transit and education, obviously. The already astronomical subway costs go up, as they are. Uh, the costs of getting an education go up, and somebody pays those costs, and they pay them to the city, so their taxes, or the, rather their equivalent of taxes, but they're highly regressive taxes. Uh, the subway costs are not paid by the guys in the limousines up on the street. They're paid by the people who are trying to get to work, or the school children who are trying to get to school. So it's a highly regressive tax, uh, which uh, is designed to essentially to redistribute income, like social policy generally. Cut taxes for the rich, increase taxes on the poor, but don't call them taxes. And poor means most everybody, remember. Uh, another aspect of it, as this, I mean, this article happens to point out, but so does a thousand others that you've read, uh, is that it's necessary to compel uh, welfare recipients to work. Now, there's some interesting assumptions there. One assumption is that a woman who's raising children isn't working. That comes free, as anybody knows who's ever done it. You know. uh, uh, remember, and in fact, notice that that's true of women's work generally. It comes free, so it's not work. And we even have a proof of that, because as you're all taught in school, we live in a meritocracy, uh, and you can determine the value of work by the amount of income that accrues to it. Well, mothers who are raising children don't get any income, so that's not work at all. On the other hand, a really meritorious work is, say, a speculation in financial markets uh, to try to dr against currencies to try to drive down international growth rates uh, so that people all around the world get poorer. That gets a lot of money. In fact, that's one of the highest paid occupations, as is uh, being an accountant for a corporation and so on. So in other words, those are the really meritorious uh, 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 employment, the most meritorious work, uh, real work, as compared with just raising children, which isn't work at all. Uh, so therefore, mothers who are raising children have to be driven into the workforce, because so they do some real work. Uh, there's a side benefit of that. The side benefit is that since there aren't any jobs, uh, they're going to have to get low-paid, publicly subsidized jobs. And since they're very low-paid, it'll have the side benefit of competing with uh, union wages and driving down wages for everybody. So by driving down these non-working mothers uh, into the workforce, by driving them into the workforce at low wages, you can drive down everybody's wages uh, while uh, business is worrying about the problem of uh, corporate coppers overflowing. Uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, um, incidentally, there's another side aspect of this to those of you who are studying economics maybe. Uh, you notice there's a kind of odd contradiction internal to all of this, which somehow doesn't seem to bother anyone. We have to drive these women who are just raising children and not working, we have to drive them into the workforce, because obviously it's unfair for them to you know, get paid for doing nothing. Uh, on the other hand, we have to keep the unemployment level high. That's a principle which is advocated by the very same people. There's what's called a natural rate of unemployment. It has to be kept around 6%, according to the current theology. Uh, because if you don't keep it at 6%, you know, maybe workers will be able to ask for higher wages and we'll have all sorts of tragedies like that. So on the one hand, you have to 
keep unemployment high. On the other hand, you have to drive uh, women who are just raising children not working into the workforce. Exactly how you resolve that contradiction hasn't been explained yet, but you know, doubtless some sophisticated person has the answer. Uh, the uh, mayor of New York did have an answer. He finally came clean on us. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, he came out and said, look, the policies that are being uh, carried out, uh, as was obvious from looking at them, uh, are designed to drive poor people out of the city. There's no place for them in New York. Uh, in New York, the only place is for the meritocracy, the people like the J.P. Morgan executives and the ones who are speculating against currencies and so on. Only the meritocracy has a place in New York, and that, of course, will follow from uh, depriving the rest of them, the non-meritorious, of uh, ability to pay their rent or to you know, ride on the subway or to uh, uh, have food or to heat their homes. Uh, or eliminating uh, health health care for the elderly and the disabled and so on. Uh, that leaves just the right people, the minority, the opulent. The rest will presumably live around the border somewhere in what they call favelas and Rio de Janeiro. They can't be too far away because they have to somehow be able to drift into the city to do all the dirty work. Uh, but they should be out on the outside in the typical third world model. Uh, and uh, uh, the Time, New York Times reported that, another front page story, which explained that, uh, I have to quote this, it explained that these measures will enable the poor to move freely around the country. The measures that we're talking about are deprivation of rent, heat, uh, food, transit, and so on. That's going to enable the poor to, tra to travel, to move freely around the country. The headline read, welfare cuts provide a chance to move. In other words, the point is all these people were trapped by this dependency, you know, and now they're finally liberated, uh, and they're free to move around the country, but not too far away because somebody's got to clean our laundry. So uh, they're now free, liberated. I mean, you know, the compassion brings tears to the eyes. Uh, it's impossible to be a satirist anymore, as a number of people have pointed out who used to try. Uh, the world is just satirizing itself, you know. You're lost, no hope. Well, there's a name for all of this. It's called tough love. Uh, and it's not a bad phrase, if you think about it. I mean, what it means is love for the minority, the opulent, and tough for everybody else. Uh, but uh, so, yeah, tough love. Uh, and there has to be tough love for the majority of the people in New York, because as J.P. Morgan has explained, the city isn't wealthy enough to keep them there. Uh, there's no tough love, on the other hand, for, say, Cobb County, Georgia. Pick an example at random, not quite, because it's the district of Newt Gingrich who's heading this campaign. Uh, Cobb County, Georgia is a very rich uh, suburb of Atlanta, uh, carefully insulated from any urban infection, very rich. Uh, it says, Gingrich describes it, a Norman Rockwell world of jet planes and fiber optics, which is accurate. Uh, if uh, you know anything about jet planes and fiber optics, you will instantly discover why Cobb County is rich. Jet planes and fiber optics are two of the many examples of the public subsidy of big corporations that's called free enterprise. Uh, free enterprise means public subsidy and private profit. And jet planes and fiber optics, like computers and electronics and just about everything else in the high-tech economy, is exactly an example of that. Public pays the costs. Private enterprise gets the profit. So, in fact, Cobb County happens to get more federal subsidies than any suburban county in the country, with two interesting exceptions. One is uh, uh, Arlington, Virginia, which is part of, the, part of Washington, D.C., so that's like where the Pentagon is and so on. And the other is, the, is Brevard County, Florida, which is the home of the Kennedy Space Center. That's another scam by which the public pays the costs of high-tech industry, you know, pretending they're putting men on the moon and that sort of business. Uh, the, so aside from the federal system itself, uh, Cobb County happens to get more federal subsidies than anyone else. In other words, Newt Gingrich is the biggest welfare freak in the country, uh, while he's, and that's, and here there is no tough love. Uh, here there's no tough love. Uh, furthermore, if you look at the details of how it goes, it's very enlightening. 
the biggest employer in Cobb County, which remember is the home of uh, entrepreneurial values where people despise the nanny state and want to get it out of their hair so that you know, their individual entrepreneurial you know, uh, commitments can flourish. Uh, the biggest employer there uh, is uh, Lockheed, now Lockheed Martin Corporation. Uh, Lockheed Martin, which just merged, two big military industries which just merged and have their corporate headquarters there. Uh, they are a typical, prototypical example of publicly subsidized private profit corporations. Uh, to call Lockheed Martin a case of uh, individual entrepreneurial values, that's beyond the level of satire, I guess, but that's what it's called. Uh, when they merged as payment for their merger, uh, they requested the Clinton administration, which will probably do it, to pay them well over a billion dollars. Uh, meanwhile, the executives paid themselves uh, about $90 million, uh, about large part of it, maybe 30 million or so from public tech, uh, funds, uh, you know, more entrepreneurial values. Uh, right now, they're in line for a $72 billion subsidy for uh, F-22 uh, jet planes, and uh, we need F-22s, and Lockheed Marietta explains why. If you read their statements, they say, we need F-22s because, I'm quoting, it's a dangerous world in which sophisticated fighter planes are being sold. Uh, well, <laughs> by whom are sophisticated fighter planes being sold? Well, it turns out by Lockheed. Uh, so I'm continuing. We've sold F-16s, the current you know, top-of-the-line plane. We've sold F-16s all over the world. What if a friend or ally turns against us? So therefore, we need F-22s to defend ourselves against the danger that the F-16s that we're, saying we're sending to various dictatorships might turn against us. Actually, the U.S. has about three-quarters of that market uh, going to public opinion. Uh, here, public opinion is only 96 percent opposed to the policy, so I guess you could say it's pretty popular by <laughs> ordinary standards. But we've got to keep doing this uh, because, uh, in fact, they're upgraded F-16s, so the taxpayer is paying multiply. They're paying Lockheed to upgrade the F-16s so they can sell them to third world dictatorships uh, with the support of 4 percent of the population uh, so that then maybe they can turn against us, so we'll need F-22s, which you guys will pay for, uh, to defend ourselves against this threat. Well, that's the way it works. Uh, if you go looking on at the military journals, like Jane's Defense Weekly, the major British-based military journal, you get a little more insight into it. You can discover that the Air Force Director of Science and Technology, General Richard Paul, explained that this is going to, as he put it, enhance uh, our economic security. How? By spinning off dual-use technology. Uh, that's a fancy term that means welfare for high-tech industry. Dual-use technology means you pretend it's for jet planes to defend yourself against somebody, but in fact you use it for commercial production, so then you can you know, praise your entrepreneurial values and denounce the nanny state, which is paying for all of this. Uh, it's welfare for corporate America, in other words, which, as General Paul put it, will transition our work, in other words, which will pick up the money that we're giving them thanks to the public payoff. Uh, well, that's, uh, this is not a subsidy, incidentally. This is not like uh, money that goes to mass transit or education, so this is not a subsidy. Uh, and in fact, that it is not a subsidy was pointed out right at the end of the Second World War when the whole system was instituted by the Secretary of the Air Force, Stuart Symington, good liberal Democrat, incidentally, uh, who pointed out that he was often called the, s the senator from Boeing when he later became a senator. Uh, the Secretary of the Air Force uh, recognized, as did the business community generally, uh, that, well, as Fortune magazine put it, uh, high-tech industry could not survive in an unsubsidized, competitive, free enterprise economy, and therefore the government has to step in to be the savior, but we, we must not Simington went on to say, we should not call it subsidy, we should call it security. In other words, you guys out there are supposed to be thinking you're paying for your security against somebody, you know, Martians or maybe people in the third world who were selling F-16s to or something, but we know it's subsidy, and in fact it is. Uh, the entire 
virtually the entire functioning part of the advanced sector of the economy lives off that public, public subsidy. That's well known in the business community not reported very much. You'll have to look pretty hard for it. It's not counted when, when people do talk about corporate welfare now and then, but they rarely, if ever, talk about the most serious part of it, which is this part by far. Uh, so that's not subsidy, that's uh, security. Uh, and in fact, that's exactly, w that's the main reason, in my opinion, why p the Pentagon spending is staying very high. Uh, it's now not very far from average Cold War levels, uh, about 15% below. It's actually higher in real terms than it was under Nixon. Uh, the Heritage Foundation, which is you know the big right-wing think tank that uh, proposes the plans that the Gingrich Army implements, uh, they recently came out with their new budget proposal, which is to cut everything that might help ordinary people, but to increase Pentagon spending, because they know perfectly well that the state sector of the economy is critically important as uh, to put money into the pockets of the folks in Cobb County and others like them so they can rail against the nanny state uh, and insist on tough love for other people. Uh, well, uh, in how about the public opinion on that? Same. Uh, of all public spending, Pentagon spending has the lowest support. That is the greatest opposition. So therefore, that's the one that we've got to increase. Uh, consistent with uh, the rest of the relation between public policy and public attitudes. Well, tough love in this sense is kind of like free markets. Free markets have always meant pretty much what they mean now. It's always been, a, you look through history, it's been a double-edged doctrine. Uh, what it means is market discipline for some people, poor people, for example, but plenty of protection for us, for the rich people. We get state protection, we get subsidy. Uh, that has always been the case the case now. Uh, that's one of the reasons why the third world and the first world are so different, incidentally. They were pretty similar back in the 18th century. And now it's being brought home. So, yeah, market discipline for, uh, you know, mothers with children whose seven-year-old kids have to learn responsibility, but no market discipline for the uh, corporate executives who have to have public funds poured into their pocket uh, by various measures, uh, the Pentagon system being the biggest of them. Well, this goes on and on, and it's getting late, so I won't give any more details. So there are plenty, and they're interesting. Uh, but just to give an indication of how far it's gone and why the art of satire is unfortunately collapsing, uh, let me just end by quoting a recent article in the Wall Street Journal, my favorite reading, in fact. Uh, we have a lot of good news, incidentally. I like the business press generally. Uh, they had an article with the headline, uh, congressional Republicans call for defunding the left a couple of weeks ago. So they're tired of all this public funds going into the pockets of radicals. Uh, well, uh, the story went on to say Republicans take aim at left-leaning groups that get federal grants for assistance programs. Pretty bad stuff. Uh, well, who are the left-leaning groups? The top one by far in the list was Catholic Charities. Uh, and if you look down at the explanation, the reason is that nuns and priests, many of whom work without pay, run programs uh, to try to bring low in to help low income heating and to run head start uh, courses for uh, head start programs for poor people. So that's a less so Catholic charities for that reason is a left leaning group, and we got to defund this uh, their radical agenda. Uh, the next on the list, is the uh, AARP, American Association of Retired People. Uh, and the reason why that radical group has to be defunded, they explain, is that it has programs, it sinks even this low, it has programs to help elderly Americans get jobs. Uh, remember that there's another Wall Street Journal story which said one out of six of those elderly Americans is suffering from malnutrition, and many of them are, in their words, literally starving. Uh, but if somebody wants to try to help them get jobs, we've got to defund these dangerous radicals. And it goes on like that. Uh, in fact, you get a pretty clear sense of who the left is. Uh, the left, anybody who has any interest in helping human beings belongs to the left and has to be stopped. Instantly, for people who consider themselves as being on the left, that's not only pretty flattering, uh, but also kind of encouraging, uh, because it means that the left is a vast... Uh, 
array of people, in fact, which is not totally untrue if you look at public attitudes. It's virtually everybody. Anyone who cares about human beings has to be stopped because the goal is to turn the country into something that looks like the third world uh, with the minority, the opulent, well protected, plenty of state subsidies. Heritage Foundation is going to make sure of that uh, so they can be, uh, you know, big entrepreneurs like uh, the CEOs of Lockheed Martin and the rest of Cobb County. Uh, but uh, the rest of the population gets the tough part of tough love. Well, these things are not laws of nature, plainly. They are human decisions. Uh, they're being made within human institutions. It's been done before. It's been combated before. It's been successfully combated before. Uh, I gave a couple of examples before, and there are many others. Uh, it's never been easy to try to defend and struggle for human rights and freedom and democracy and justice. It's never been impossible. It's not easy now, and it's not impossible now. And I think there has rarely been a moment in history when that choice uh, has carried such enormous uh, human consequences. Professor Noam Chomsky has taught at MIT for the last 30 years. For a copy of this program, call 1-800-C-SPAN-98. The cost of the video is $29.95, plus shipping and handling. Tonight, here on C-SPAN 2, African American Men and Society, a forum hosted by Howard University. Panelists discuss the status of African American men in today's society and examine a recent report by the Federal Sentencing Commission. The program airs Sunday at 11 a.m. Eastern Time, 8 a.m. Pacific, on C-SPAN 2. And then later this evening on C-SPAN, our companion network, People and Politics of the United Kingdom, a speech by Prime Minister John Major at the annual Conservative Party Conference. Each week, while the House of Commons is on recess, we bring you programs looking at other aspects of British politics and society. Sunday at 9 p.m. Eastern and Pacific Time. Next, a speech by NAACP Chairman Merle Evers-Williams. She spoke recently at the Anti-Defamation League Award Dinner for the late Supreme Court Justice Thurgood Marshall. Her remarks last 30 minutes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. My thanks to Warren Dennis for that uh, introduction. And but you've also been so intimidated by him. Intimidated in the best possible kind of way. Because he was a big man. He was tall. He was imposing. His voice, his carriage, everything about him. And I remember when he would come to Mississippi at Medgar Evers' request, and sometimes they would sit around after business had been taken 
taken care of. And I, I was young at that time and still had led a rather sheltered life. And there were times when um, he would let out that robust laugh and would use a few, few words that would make me shrink at that time. But that's who he was. That was what he, he was. A man who, who devoted his life to justice and equality for all, all people. Someone who would come to Mississippi and get off of, of the plane and the policemen were always there taking down uh, uh, car tag numbers and, and being intimidating in a, in a very negative sense. And, and Thurgood Marshall walked as though they did not even exist. as though he had no, no fear. And in his own, own manner, intimidated the intimidators. Because there was no way they, they could get to him. He was sure of him, himself, of who he was. Two Canadian provinces and the District of Columbia. Now, what makes him interesting and deserving, I, that's perhaps the not the, the, the right term to use in this context, but why I, I thought he should be in the book, is the fact that he stole these books not out of greed, not to sell them, as most other book thieves have done, but because he loved them and to collect them. Syndicated columnist Nicholas Baspains and his book, A Gentle Madness, Bibliophiles, Bibliomanes, and the Eternal Passion for Books, Sunday night on Book Notes at 8 Eastern and Pacific Time. Today on C-SPAN 2, African American Men and Society, a forum hosted by Howard University. Panelists discuss the status of African American men in today's society and examine a recent report by the Federal Sentencing Commission. The program airs today at 11 a.m. Eastern Time, 8 a.m. Pacific on C-SPAN 2. Next. President Clinton in a Friday night speech to the Williamsburg, Virginia Business Council. He talks about the budget, trade, and the economy. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States, accompanied by the officers of the Business Council and their wives.
As the preacher says, please have a seat. I'd like to introduce our guests this evening, and then I'll introduce the president who will speak before dinner. Minister Cavallo and his wife Sonia from Argentina. <laughs> Minister Milan and his wife Katerina, Brazil. <laughs> Minister Ortiz and his wife Margie, Mexico. Mr. Ruggiero, Director General, World Trade Organization, who's been working the crowd all day today. <laughs> Ms. Laura Tyson, Assistant to the President on e for Economic Policy. <laughs> and the Honorable Richard M. Daly, Mayor of the City of Chicago, and his wife Maggie, who made a great presentation to us today. Mr. President, it's a great honor for all of us to have you be with us this evening. You were properly introduced today by your friend, Hugh Seide. I want you to know, compared to his characterization of your chief rivals, you came out remarkably well. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you very much. The last time I was with the Woolards, uh, we were in Jackson Hole, Wyoming, in the Grand Tetons, and that this outfit would have been highly inappropriate there, out of the fact that way over 90 percent of the new jobs created in this recovery were created not by government, but in the private sector. That is exactly what we wanted to happen. So as we reduce the size of government, the private sector is growing more. We have to do it, but we have to do it consistent with our values and with our interests. The second thing we have to do is to expand trade. We have our friends here from the Americas. Uh, Mac McClarty, who's here with me, worked so hard last December on the summit of the Americas. And we have worked to follow up on that. We believe that our partners in this hemisphere are a very, very important part of our future. We believe we have to build on NAFTA until we have partnerships with all these democratic governments to reward their moves to democracy, to freedom, to market economics with a genuine and respectful partnership with the United States. In that connection, I would say I was very well pleased with the remarkable uh, visit I just had with the President of Mexico and the fact that they have already paid back $700 million of the loan they received through our international financial package ahead of schedule, being faithful to their commitments to modernize Mexico politically and economically. We have to continue to invest in technology and make it our friend, not our foe. People cannot afford to be afraid of the technological revolution that is sweeping the world. We just have to make sure that everybody can have access to it. And we have to give people the tools they need to succeed. In that connection, let me say I am very grateful for the support that we've gotten from the business community for every education initiative of our administration, from expanding Head Start to the Goals 2000 program, which focuses on national standards and grassroots reforms, to the expansion of student loans. And just a couple of days ago, I know the Secretary of Labor said this earlier, but I want to emphasize this because it achieved almost no public notice, largely because there were only two votes against this bill in the Senate, and when there's no controversy, it is often deemed not important. But with no controversy, a couple of days ago, the United States Senate adopted what I thought was one of the most important new ideas that I advocated in the State of the Union message, the GI Bill for America's Workers, consolidating 70 separate, marginally impacting federal training programs into a big fund and saying to unemployed people, we will just send you a voucher. We will send you a voucher if you lose your job and you can immediately take it to the nearest community college and begin to start your life again. 
Now, that's very important. A lot of you pay a lot of unemployment tax. The unemployment system today is not relevant to the, to the times in which we live. When the unemployment system in America was developed, 85% of the people were called back to the jobs they were laid off from. Today, 85% of the people who are laid off are never called back to those jobs. If we want people to feel secure about the future, to have a stake in the future, we have to increase their sense of empowerment about it. That's what this GI Bill for America's workers will do. It's a very important idea, and we ought to stick with it and support it and properly fund it. Now, let me say something in all candor. To have, if we're going to continue to move forward in a time of change, you have to expect the leadership of the country to do what you have to do in a time of change, and that's to make decisions that are unpopular in the short run because they're right over the long run. Now, I have found as an elected official that everybody is for that in general, but they're against it in particular. And let me just give you some examples of the kind of things I've faced. I bet I've done five things that have made everybody in this room mad in the last two and a half years, at least five. But I want to give you a few. When I became president, I knew, based on my conversations with Mr. Greenspan, with people in the private markets, with others, that if we could reduce the deficit at least $500 billion in five years, we'd get a big drop in interest rates and a big boom in this economy. I knew that. And I knew, conversely, if we failed to do it, that we would continue to lengthen the sluggish economy which I confronted when I took office. So I made up my mind, come hell or high water, we were going to reduce the deficit $500 billion. And the first week I showed up in Washington, the leaders of the minority in Congress this year, our exports. The deficit has come from 290 a year down to $160 billion a year. Of course, there are still problems. In any period of profound change, there tends to be a big disruption and a significant problem of income inequality. We have that in America. We need to get more energy and growth back into middle class families' incomes. We have still some isolated areas in our country that have not felt the benefits of this recovery. And I believe that the budget proposal now in Congress would undermine our economic growth in the future unless it's modified significantly, and I'll say more about that in a moment. I think the policies of this administration have made a contribution to that economic record by reducing the deficit, by expanding trade through NAFTA and GATT and taking all those outdated Cold War controls off of our high technology exports by concluding over 80 trade agreements through the efforts of Ambassador Canner, including 15 with Japan alone, by investing in technology, research and development, and defense conversion, and by working with so many of you to manifest a real commitment to the education of all Americans. More money, but also higher standards, higher expectation, and more accountability in education. If you look at the question of our social problems and whether we've been successful in putting middle-class values into our approach, you can all be somewhat hopeful there. The crime rate is down in almost every place in America. The murder rate is down. The welfare rolls are down. The food stamp rolls are down. The poverty rate is down. The teen pregnancy rate has gone down for two years in a row. Americans are reasserting their belief in old-fashioned personal, family, and community responsibility. And it is beginning to work. Yes, we have some problems. We still need to pass a national welfare reform plan, I believe. We still need to avoid the, the tendency that's now alive in Congress to believe that all you need to do on the crime problem is to put people in jail, and we don't need anything to do with prevention and giving our young people something to say yes to. But basically, we are moving in the right direction to reassert and reinsert into American life mainstream values. And I believe the initiatives of our administration have played a role in that. The crime bill, which is putting 100,000 more police on the street, keeping repeat offenders off the street, passing the Brady Bill, passing the assault weapons ban, doing things that enable our local communities to help prevent crimes. I think it's making a difference. I believe the work we've done in what the New York Times called a quiet revolution in welfare. 
Our administration has given 35 states over 40 separate approvals to get around federal rules and regulations to move people from welfare to work. When the Congress wouldn't pass the bill, we just decided to reform welfare state by state, community by community. We have offered all 50 states within a, any 30-day period a complete relief from any number of federal rules and regulations if they will present a comprehensive plan to move people from welfare to work without hurting their children. I think when we almost doubled the family tax credit that President Reagan said was the best anti-poverty program the country had ever come up with. So that we can now say that anybody who works 40 hours a week and has children in the home will not live in poverty. That was a major step toward rewarding work and family and helping us to reward, uh, reform welfare and get people out of welfare into the work roles. I think the National Service Program is an important advance. We celebrated its first year yesterday with a young woman from Kansas City who's working her way through college from an inner city neighborhood in Kansas City with a project of young volunteers who have closed 44 crack houses in Kansas City in the last year. And this is the kind of thing being done by these young people all over America, whether they're building houses with Habitat for Humanity, tutoring kids in rural Kentucky where they have increased the grade level in reading by threefold in one year, are helping to fight the crime problem. All these things manifest our values. And something I know that means a lot to all of you, we have tried to give the American people a more modern government. The size of the federal government tonight, when I left Washington, was 163,000 smaller than it was the day I became president. It's the smallest federal government since John Kennedy was president. We will reduce it by another 110,000 in the next two years, no matter what the Congress does with this budget. This government, as a percentage of the civilian non-farm payroll, is the smallest government the United States has had in Washington since 1933. Now, those are facts. We've reduced 16,000 pages of regulations cut the regulations of the Small Business Administration by 50 percent, the regulations of the Education Department by 40 percent. Next year, the paperwork time that businesses spend fooling with the Environmental Protection Agency will be down by 25 percent. More important than all that to me, I think our government's working better. The Small Business Administration's cut its budget by 40 percent and doubled its loan output. The Export-Import Bank is helping small businesses that never knew what it was before to sell their products all around the world. The Commerce Department and the State Department have done more good for American businesses overseas than any Commerce Department and State Department in modern history, and every one of you who has worked with them know that that is the absolute truth. We are moving forward to give you a government that works. Some, the automobile industry has been working with us in partnership to produce a clean car. It is a big deal. 1995 was the hottest year for the planet Earth since the present temperature system was devised. China is growing rapidly. If everybody in China winds up with a car and you don't want the atmosphere of this Earth to burn up, we had better find an efficient way of moving people around. And this is the sort of thing that we're trying to do. Now, let me tell you this, this will probably surprise you more than anything. Every year, Business Week, hardly an arm of the Democratic Party or my administration, recognizes outstanding businesses for performance in various categories. This year, in the category of service to consumers by telephone, the winner was not L.L. Bean or Federal Express, but the Social Security Administration of your federal government. So I think that we have made a contribution to modernizing the federal government. It's smaller, it's less bureaucratic, it is more entrepreneurial. It still has dumb things in the rules and it does dumb things that drive me crazy that I find out about after it's over, but it is better than it was before by a very, very long shot. And the most important thing is we're trying to help move decisions back where people make them. The mayor of Chicago is here. Chicago received one of our empowerment zones, a new idea helping to attract private investment into inner cities to grow the economy and give people a stake in America's future. Chicago received more funds for police, not because we know how to prevent crime, but they do if they have the means to do it. 
and funds for prevention to support programs like the ones in Chicago that have lowered the crime rate even though they make fodder for congressional speeches like midnight basketball. Better a kid on a basketball court than on a corner selling drugs or mugging somebody and winding up in jail. We didn't make the decisions, they make the decisions at the local level. We finally passed a bill to stop mandating costs on state and local governments that we don't help them pay for. These are the kinds of things that are going on. We are moving in the right direction. Your country is, and you ought to be proud of it. And America has been gratified to be a part of making peace in the Middle East, progress in Northern Ireland, the ceasefire in Bosnia, making sure that for the first time since the dawn of the nuclear age, there aren't any missiles pointed at Americans or their children tonight. North Korea is moving away from its nuclear program, and by the grace of God, we might get a comprehensive test ban treaty on all nuclear testing next year. We seem to be headed in that direction. Now, what does the future hold? First, we do have to balance the budget. It's the right thing to do to take the burden of debt off our children and free up capital for private sector investment. I'm really proud. I felt more at home, but I saw Ed tonight, and I kind of, I'm jealous of that beautiful shirt. I want to know where you got it. <laughs> I'm so glad to see all of you. I know some of our administration members have been here. Uh, Secretary Rubin, who feels right at home. I still can't believe Bob Rubin's a Democrat. <laughs> He told me not very long ago we were going to have to change the currency to avoid counterfeiting. And I said, well, all right. And he said, but I want to start with $100 bills. <laughs> so that's where we started. I have reviewed uh, a little bit about who spoke here today and what they said. And uh, Ed, if Hugh Sidey really said that. He must have been awful tough on the people who are running against me. <laughs> I want to talk to you tonight about, obviously, about the major controversy presently raging in Washington about uh, the balanced budget. But I want to try to set the stage for what this is, really means and what's really going on. And I'd like to begin with what I think is the most important thing, which is what kind of country we live in and what kind of country we wish to live in and what kind of country we wish to live our, leave for our children and our grandchildren. That, after all, is the most important thing of all. When I sought this job in 1992, I did it because I wanted to restore the American dream for all of our people and because I wanted this country to go into the next century still as the world's leader for freedom and peace and prosperity and democracy, because I really believe that we're all better off in a country where people have opportunity but exercise responsibility, where we strengthen work but we also strengthen our families, and where we recognize that the real power in America should be at the community level, where people work together and where they deal with each other directly instead of through the filters that exist between me in Washington and you where you live. This is a remarkable period of success for America's economy. All of you are doing a remarkable job. We've had a great two and a half years, and I believe there are better times ahead if we make the right decisions. Uh, it's a time of profound change. We're moving from the industrial to the information and technology age. We've moved out of the Cold War into a global marketplace. We have problems, to be sure, but they're nowhere near as great as the opportunities we have. When I sought the presidency, I said that I wanted to do three things. I wanted to restore pro-growth economics. I wanted to put mainstream values back at the heart of our social policy. And I wanted to give America a modern government that was more entrepreneurial and smaller and gave more authority to the state and local governments, to the private sector, and operated more as a partner with others to build a better America. I said then, and I believe I have been true to this, that I wanted to see new ideas injected into our political life, everything from welfare reform to national service to empowerment zones for our inner cities to the reinventing government program that the Vice President has done such a good job with. 
I said I would make a good faith effort to move beyond the partisan labels that had divided people so much in the past. And believe it or not, I have done my best to do that. It's a lot harder in Washington than it is in the state capitals and the cities of the country, but it can be done and it will be done again, I believe, in the next few weeks. I also believe then, and I believe more strongly now, that in a time of change, it's important that the president make decisions based on their long-term impact as opposed to their short-term benefits or burdens. Now, if you look at the last two and a half years, you must all be very proud. Our country has produced seven and a half million jobs, two and a half million new homeowners, about two million new small business owners, the largest number of new small businesses in such a time period in the history of the United States, a record number of new self-made millionaires. Trade has increased in the last three years from 4% in 93, 10% in 94, and it's going up 16%.